especially many of you are in the communications uh, department, communication department, studying art of communication, and even satellite communication. I was told by your HOD that there is a topic on, uh, there is a subject on satellite communication. So you would have had some exposure to this topic. It will be a good revision. It will, it will give you a good overview of the subject. So with that introduction, let me go. So my presentation will cover the basics of art of communication. This, this is what we learn in October education at the college level. And slowly migrate to satellite communication and I will show you some real practical satcom hardware. I will discuss what are the new trends and in, in India and in Israel we have implemented some of the latest trends in satcom. I will discuss about that and I will show you a video of about 3 minutes on a satcom vision of Israel. This is as an example. Next. Now the basics of art of communication. Next. So what is communication? Communication is sending information from one place to another place, one point to another point. So one means a transmitter, a receiver, at the other end and the medium to perform the transfer of the communication, transfer of the material or subject or signal to be transferred. The Victorian I have given the representations next. These are the few examples of communication tools. Some of them are transmissive, some of them are only received. Next. Now what are the different communication media? When I am talking here, you are receiving my voice. What is the media here? It's the air column. It's the air column between the speaker and the listener. There are other medias like cables, optical fiber cables or simply metallic cables. Of course, we, we, in all the media, there will be attenuation to the signal. So it, is, it requires repeaters in every communication media. Like for example, cable systems may have a repeater every few kilometers, overhead lines, VHF systems, UHF systems, and microwave line of sight systems with the repeaters every 50 kilometers. What happens is, as you travel from VHF to UHF and microwave, it becomes more line of sight. So the Earth's temperature, the attenuation offered by the atmospheric effect, only will decide at what distance you have to keep the repeater. The VHF and UHF systems will probably have a larger range uh, because they use the Earth itself as a sort of a supporting guide for their transmission. Then in radio systems we might have, you might have heard about proto scatter systems, ionospheric reflections, then comes the satellite communication with satellites acting as a repeater of the signals located at a very far distance, greater than 10,000 kilometers. Next. Now let us see what are the frequency ranges we are talking about in this communication methods. Uh, I have started from megahertz range. Of course, when I am talking to you directly, you know the standard audio range, you know? Can anyone tell what is the standard audio range of a voice? <laughs> Lovely. Okay, uh, you are a bit 
it doesn't matter. Uh, it's about four, three to four kilohertz range. So I am talking about uh, frequency bands, which are in the higher bands, starting from three megahertz. Uh, classifying them as per the standard designation given by the international organizations like ITU, CCITT, CCIR. These are the international organizations which classify the frequency bands. According to them, the high frequency, VHF, very high frequency, ultra high frequency, the long wave, short wave. And short wave also is called as the S band. The 2 to 4 gigahertz is S band. You might have heard a lot of controversies about S band in the media, in the Indian media. So S band. And the very standard C band, which used to be the main frequency used for the satellite communication in the earlier years, but not anymore. And the defense and strategic bands, KU band, curse under KU band, K band, simply curse band, KA band, curse above, and of course, very high frequency B band. In this row, we have used the C band, the S band, UHF, and we have gone to KU, KA, and B band also. We have recently, in one of the satellites, GSAT 30, we have used B band also. Next. That being the frequency description classification, let us talk about signals. Okay, satellite communication. Broadly, I should have told a bit earlier, sorry for that. Satellite communication means interface to the satellite is always RF. RF, which we said, you know, C band, K band, R band, and all that, which is at a very high frequency. The communication itself consists of the, the base band, the, the small signal the low level, low frequency signals and then the high or of frequencies which is used for the satellite communication. In between the baseband and the RF and the high or of frequency there can be another RF medium called as an intermediate frequency and this is for the conveniences of controlling the, the characteristics of transmission, characteristics of attenuation higher frequencies are used. For example, in an earth station, you will be receiving all baseband signals like voice, television and all that. It will modulate and it will be shifted to a higher frequency. Usually, higher frequencies are 70 megahertz, in some cases 140 megahertz. This higher frequency goes to OFC or metallic cables to, uh, from the controlling station to the RF access station, it goes to IF cables or OFCs. The distance between these two can be just 100 meters to a few kilometers away. At the other end, at the antenna end, where the RF power is kept, RF high power amplifiers are kept, it will be converted to the IF will be shifted to the high frequency like C band or S band or K band, R band like that. They will be an up converter. So what I was trying to say is the small small frequency signal, intermediate frequency, high frequencies. For the time being, let us forget about the IF because it's only a buffer media, buffer frequency media. We will talk about the small signals and the R frequencies. Coming to the small signal, it can be two different types, analog signal and digital signal. Analog signal examples can be voice, music, image, picture, motion picture, video. Digital will be, as you know, it, it the signal going up and down, ones and zeros. These signals cannot travel far. They have a limitation. Next. How do we carry signals over long distances? 
it is achieved by using a high frequency carrier and modulating the carrier by the basic signal. So, we are talking about modulation. We talked about the baseband signal, now we are coming to the modulation. Modulation is necessary to carry the small signal to a farther distance. The modulation types can be analog and digital. <coughs> modulation types can be analog or digital. Next. Let us see each one of them. The analog modulation. The basic signal, which is an analog signal, modulates another analog signal, which is called as a carrier, or which is at a high frequency level. Then, <coughs> you get different types of modulation types. Amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, and phase modulation. The left side is an example of an amplitude modulation. The amplitude of the carrier varies as per the level of the baseband signal. Next is the frequency modulation. The frequency of the carrier varies as per the varying or varying signal of the baseband. And third case is the, the phase variation of the carrier by the baseband signal. Next.
There will be only one key I get from the media. So that one key I get should carry all the different input signals. That is where the multiplexing comes to our help. Allow signals from different sources or channels to share common medium or path. Here we have frequency division multiplexing, time division multiplexing, code division multiplexing. The first one, the entire channel is shared indefinitely. You assume some wide bandwidth. In that wide bandwidth, you bifurcate the bandwidth into 5, 10, 20 like that. You allot each smaller segment for one user. He uses that band indefinitely. Of course, it will be a moderated carrier, not a baseband carrier. So, each of the pre assigned set slots will be occupied by one user. One user means one moderated carrier. In time division multiplexing, the entire wide band is occupied by one user, but that user will come at several time bus there will be a coordination at the transmission station where when user A, user B, user C will be allowed in in a gated way. In coordination multiplexing again, the different users will occupy the media all the time, but each one will be uh, having a code attached with it to identify the user. Multiple users have access to the entire channel for the entire duration. Different codes are used to distinguish among the different users. This is the code division multiplexing. Next. <coughs> so, this is a pictorial representation of the frequency division multiplexing. The total media is divided into various bands. Various users are occupying the different bands and they will be occupying indefinitely from the input side to the output side. Next. This is something different. Multiplexing is one thing. I have some suddenly come to access. Frequency division multiple access. From frequency division multiplexing, I am talking about after the multiplex signal, which is various baseband signals, modulated signals, again for um, so a modulated overlap subcarrier of different frequencies, for example 64, 68, 72, 76, 108, so many subcarriers are modulating and each of them are taken to a further multiplexing stage and then it is sent to either to the microwave line of sight or to the satellite or to through aerial media or it can be even a fiber optic cable. I hope I am clear. Baseband signal, modulation, then for transmission to a long distance Another modulation on a subcarrier like 64, 68, something like that. These subcarriers are multiplexed again and then transmitted. Next. Coming back to the fundamental thing, we talked about frequency division multiplexing. This is a time division multiplexing. As I told, transmitter 1, transmitter A, B, and X. Therefore, each of the users. There is a switch by which in the time scale the, the burst, the digital burst of A followed by B and followed by up to X appears and then again it repeats after a gap, time gap, again A, B, C up to X it repeats. Of course, this has to be properly embedded vehicle identifications. Next. 
time duration multiplexes frame structure. There should be, I, I said, it, there should be proper identification. The right terminology, technical terminology is a preamble. <coughs> User one keeps his packets of information ready. One, two, three packets are ready. User two, user three, like that. Now there is a switch which connects each of the users in a time slot with an appropriate preamble which gives the total frame length and the end of the frame and repetition of the frame. You see the preamble is repeating again and again, one, two, three, and continuously, endlessly. So here I have shown three users, it can be any number of users. This is the time division multiplexes schematic. Next. CDMA. CDMA, each of the users, the data signal is, of course, it's, uh, it has to be a digital signal here. The analog signal has to be converted into a digital signal. The digital signal is modulated by a code generator. It will be a unique code for each of the users. This, code, this unique code will also be identifiable at the receiving end. So, they occupy the entire channel transponder or the media or whatever it is and at the end, at the receiving end, the code sync that the code generator which provides the uh, code division multiplexes representation, the code sync is necessary and the code is generated at the receiving end and it is removed from the signal and only the signal is demodulated out. This is the schematic. Next. Now, beyond this, very specific to satellite communication, there are certain other multiple accesses which are very commonly used. One is called as a demand assigned multiple access. A transponder will be allocated its bandwidth. Allocated means what? It has a bandwidth and the transponder power is there. These two resources are the most valuable resources. Based on the traffic demand, these resources will be allocated to a given user. This is called as demand assigned multiplexes. One specific example of DAMA is the SPADE. SPADE stands for a single channel per carrier, SCPC single channel per carrier, demand assigned multiplexes. This is one example. And there is another type of multiplexes called as ALOVA. ALOVA is a, a classical example of TDMA where data packages are transmitted in a random time domain. So for example, the earlier slide I showed that TDMA going as per the preamble and the packets of each user going in a particular way. ALOVA, the, every user is allowed to transmit in the same DDMA way or format but in a random time domain. It's a, it's a question of a chance, probability that you will be able to detect the desired signal. So there is a uh, discovery of a local channel in Hawaii area which they used because the number of users were small there in the Thailand generation. But it is not uh, very helpful for large area, large carrier, large number of users. Scenario is not very helpful. Instead of the classical aloha, a slotted aloha, where the data packets are transmitted at a fixed time interval, is a better option which has been used in uh, uh, countries like uh, US and Canada. It's the same as Aloha, it's the same as TDMA, but they don't call it as TDMA, they call it as slotted Aloha. Okay, next. Now, when the quantum of 
data has to be transmitted is enormous. How do we manage? What we do is data compression for increasing the channel carrying capacity, for enhancing the capacity of the channel. For that, data compression is possible not in the analog signal mode, it has to be in the digital mode only. So analog data is digitized first. Digital data is compression is used by various techniques. There are techniques available. One technique filters out no change or least change in the information content. You see the zero one pattern. If the pattern is repeating and there is no change in the pattern, that is filtered out. The negative data transmitted is, in that case, becomes less. So accordingly, in the receiving end, one should detect how to find the, that this particular pattern represents a constant repetition of ones or constant repetition of zeros. As a practical example for TV transmission through a satellite transponder of bandwidth 40 megahertz, Generally, we talk about the satellite transponder bandwidth of 40 megahertz. Mere analog signal with FM modulation occupies 32 megahertz, and the rest of 8 megahertz is for the broad bands either side. This will, occupy, this will carry only one TV channel. While digitized data with compression and the FM modulation occupies just 4 megahertz. You have to digitize the signal. You have to look for change of scene, uh, no change of scene, steady signal flow, all these things based on it. It's, it's not based on algorithms, mathematical, logical algorithms. It's all software based. So, the 32 megahertz TV signal can, can be made of by just 4 megahertz. So, in a 40 megahertz with broad bands, on either side, you can accommodate as many as 8 TV channels. But still, better methods have been invented, and one 40 megahertz transponder can accommodate even 20 TV channels, is a standard nowadays. If you, if you are very familiar with the Tata Bay DTH signals, they pack as many as 20 TV channels or even 24 TV channels in every transponder. The cost per transponder for them it becomes cheaper. Next. Bandwidth compression implies a reduction in the normal bandwidth of an information carrying signal without reducing the information content of the signal. Without reducing the information content means by using the signal variations. Data compression rate is defined as the ratio between the uncompressed size to compressed size. Thus, a data size of 10 MHz to 2 MB has a compression ratio of 5 is to 1. Bandwidth compression gains to the extent of 20 has been achieved in DPH mode of TV transmission. This happens every day in our case in India also. Next. <coughs> How will it enhance the reliability of performance? Whatever you are sending has got to be reliable, has got to be 100% guaranteed. It is not corrupted. It is not uh, corrupted by noise, channel noise. How do we ensure that? By employing digital modulation techniques along with coding, error detection and correction techniques. This is as far as the digital signal level is concerned. At the hour of end, the reliability of a link is managed by power control in the uplink. That is, whenever there is a signal reduction due to rain, automatically the rain attenuation is detected and the uplink power is raised. Similarly, on the dynamic power allocation in the downlink, whenever there is a Attenuation due to any reason, the onboard power is increased dynamically and the power is allocated in the downlink. 
how from where the power will come is a question it depends on how is the traffic pattern if some transponders are not fully occupied they don't consume all the power that power save can be diverted to another transponder where the power demand is there this is called as on board processing next we talked about coding and error correction error detection and all that coding improves the transmission efficiency in what i told purpose is to minimize the effect of channel noise contribution minimize the signal corruption due to noise and ensure reliable communication at a given channel noise level various coding techniques are in use i am just listing a few popular one uh, bosch chaudhary hoffman coding uh, we use this coding bch coding it's called we use it in our uh, satellite telecommunication system it is a classic cyclic error correcting boards that are constructed using polynomials over a finite field they use boards which are polynomial derivatives of the coding technique and that is combined along with the signal to be transmitted in the digital format of course the signal conversion all those things follows later this is bch coding convolution coding with the output signal from the coder is convoluted <coughs> based on a certain logical function in the coder the coder will have a certain logic a software logic and the signal output from the coder will be converted into the software logic and you have to have the corresponding decoding equipment on the other end receiving end to get it back the original signal digital signal next read solomon coding is also quite popular here assume there are s bit symbols this means that the encoder takes k data symbols of a space k data symbols of a space and adds parity symbols to make an n symbol code word which i have mentioned so many things it simply means you add parity codes parity codes to an already existing information data code stream and then these parity codes are looped for at the receiving end parity codes are removed and the parity codes positions are, are changed it is understood that there is a error detection error detected and then that packet is rejected and a retransmission is requested turbo coding the initial message is coded in three copies turbo coding you create three copies of the same message the first copy is the original data original signal in the digital format it's a non encoded data the second copy is a modified by encoding each bit of information using an algorithm shared by the coder and decoder the algorithm has to be known both at the coder end and the decoder end this is a second set of data message the third version is also encoded but after modification some perturbation is done in the packet and the encoded and but modified in this third case it is no longer the original message that is encoded and then sent but rather a transformed version these three versions are then decoded and compared in order to find if there are any errors in the original message and uh, all these things are done by hardware logics and uh, nowadays it is around it being done by software logic in the coder and the uh, decoder system hardware next <coughs> free emphasis and de emphasis the baseline signals pass through several uh, equipments 
and several filters, several cable interfaces. So often these signals spread over some frequency band undergoes characteristic variations like attenuation at generally it is attenuation at high frequency ends. This is due to mainly due to integration hardware and filters in the network. The act of boot boosting the signal at the high frequency end of the signal at the transmission end and the corresponding opposite act at the receiving end are termed as free emphasis first and de emphasis. And they are very simple uh, amplification circuits with filtering and amplification circuits. Uh, this is a systematic representation, but the actual implementation could be quite different, quite, uh, quite exhaustive. Next. You, you, one, one need to know that there is a free emphasis and de emphasis security requirement in a communication system to take care of frequency attenuations at lower frequency and higher frequency ends. From experience, I can tell you that the higher frequency end suffers attenuation when it passes through a media uh, because there is a sort of an attenuation at higher frequencies. What is the modulation types used in SATCOM? In the much earlier days, it was purely analog modulation, either FM modulation or the PM phase modulation, which were the most commonly used analog modulation schemes. The present times, it is more digital, although analog modulation also continues to be used for certain applications like the TV signal delivery uh, bottom, as not for the DDH for TV signal delivery from one point to another point, like that. So, in the digital format, the signal format would be PCM or a differential PCM and then the modulation as by PPSA, by this shifting or the PPSA and then the RF carrier will be either FM modulated or PM modulated, phase modulated. Next. Now, uh, so far I have touched upon the basics of uh, the baseband signals, its characteristics, uh, the multiplexing, the coding, how to enhance the reliability of transmission, all these things I have touched upon. I am slowly migrating to satellite communication in the sense as I told, satellite communication always deals with RF, RF interface. Next. Why do we use a satellite? Because it is cost effective as compared to terrestrial systems. Terrestrial system you will lay from one point to another point to extend that you have to keep extending the terrestrial link. Whereas, from the space, you can have a better access over longer areas, and that's why it is cost effective. Distant independent communication links is not limited to 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers. Uh, it can be it is going beyond 10,000 kilometers. Large area coverage irrespective of terrain conditions. Ease of configuring and expanding networks. Space based reference of high accuracy. A quickest reach independent of distance. Observation of the very large areas from a vantage viewpoint. These are all the advantages. Coverage of land masses that are not our own. Uh, if you want to cover the Middle East area or if you want to cover Australia, uh, those land masses not our own, but we can still provide a coverage. I will show the coverage, such coverages, uh, which can cover land masses that are not in our, in our own. Next. 
Okay, types of communication, satellite systems, international systems, citizen, these are all uh, uh, no more valid. Uh, many of them are, have gone international anyway. These are all the old classifications. Intersat, Intersport, maybe Inmarsat or all international systems, regional systems like Utelsat, Arabsat, Alapa, Miasat. Miasat is Malaysian satellite system. And that our India is classified as an under domestic system. We can say we have also gone international because we have coverages extending from the Middle East up to Australia. Next. Now, what services are you providing using a satellite communication? Basically, the telecommunication means voice modulated transmissions. We has very small aperture terminals uh, which are used mostly for business communications. And the same VSAS can also be configured as a captive network. Uh, I have an organization like say ISRO. ISRO can have its own captive network. It can have VSAS at each of the working centers and use, use the satellite bandwidth and communicate only between ISRO centers. Such networks are called as captive networks. Any corporate can have such captive networks and therefore corporate networks is called. Business communications, I said, for example, you might have seen many of the ATMs have a small antenna on top of the building and they communicate to the uh, the central branch uh, through the VSAT links, uh, messaging about the transactions and all that. Broadband applications like the internet delivery, administrative services, central government or state government administrative services, you provide the terminals at each state headquarters or district headquarters, collect various information, the n number of information you can collect administrative services. Of course, there are specialized communications like the <coughs> search and rescue, disaster management. Uh, you have a, a meteorological payload on the satellite. You want to transmit that meteorological data. Um, So the data transmission of the meteorological payload on board a satellite and the remote sensing, you will be hearing about remote sensing satellites, remote sensing data collection, remote sensing data collection is going to be transmitted back to Earth from that purpose. These are all the various applications, services, next. Now, satellite communication, the flow is like this. Baseband signal, which is mostly digital in the present era, and then the modulation and multiplexing, then the IF level signal, then translated to RF level signal and access to the satellite. Once it goes to the satellite, it has to come back. It cannot be simply reside in there. So it comes back from the satellite and the reverse flow also takes place, and uh, the baseband signal is to one from one user, it can be to another user. Next. The structure of a satellite communication system. I have said the user end to one end, user end to the other end. You run a satellite, you have the ground station, uplink ground station, downlink ground stations. Just remember there is a time delay of the transmission which is to the extent up to 60 milliseconds. From the user end will be the digital baseband. It will go to an IF a link, and here it is the R of conversion and goes to the satellite. Next. On the satellite, what is there? On the satellite, you have a receive antenna to receive the uplink signal from the ground. You have the transmit antenna transmit the signal to a downlink station 
which can be the same or a different station. In between, you have a big block, what is a repeater. Many times, this receive antenna and the transmitter antenna can be one single antenna. It's in that case, it is called as a trans receiver antenna. The repeater will have a low noise amplifier. Of course, it will have some filters to filter out all unwanted all unwanted interfering signals. After the filter, there will be a low noise amplifier. There will be a frequency conversion. If there are multiple channels, there will be a demuxing. And then the power amplifiers. And then an output muxing. And then the two various filters and cabling or wave guiding in the both the transmit area. This is how the block diagram of the communication payload is represented. So the antenna subsystem has the meter. Next. <coughs> Frequency band for satellite communication it is anywhere between UH of 300 megahertz to E band 75 gigahertz. <coughs> Next. Next. Factors influencing a satellite communication link. Can you go back to the previous one? Next, previous. Previous, sorry. Huh. This is the, there is a lot of loss that happens in this segment. Free space loss and other losses. Let me come back. Free space loss, a loop angle or elevation to the satellite, based on that, there will be some losses. There will be atmospheric absorption based on molecular oxygen, water vapor, rain, and thick clouds, fog, fog, snow, and hay. These are applicable to northern latitudes in the US, Canada, and all that. And uh, the background cosmic noise. Next. Free space loss. How to assess the free space loss? Basic rule comes from the classical radar equation. Loss of color signal traveling in free space is given as lambda by 4 pi r the whole square, where r is the distance from the transmitter to to the place where the signal is measured. Lambda is of course the wavelength associated with the transmission. Here, this equation presumes an isotropic radiation. So the transmitting antenna is taken as one which transmits all around 360 degrees. We need to apply a transmit antenna gain and also the receive antenna gain factors uh, because we use generally we use all directional antennas. Not, not isotropic antennas. Therefore, the power received at the satellite receive antenna is PT transmitted power received gain antenna divided by 4 pi r square. Frequency plays an important role as gain of the transmit and receive antennas are related to the frequency of operation. So that is where the antenna gain is 4 pi into the actual physical area into the aperture efficiency divided by the lambda square the frequency population comes. Next. Effect of elevation on signal loss. I have given for 4 to 6 gigahertz same type of for graphs one can search in the literature for other frequencies like the 12 gigahertz and uh, 28 gigahertz and all that. The vertical column, the y-axis is the percentage of signal power lost. See, 10, 20, 30, 40 dBs are lost. And the elevation angle, 
if the elevation angle is less 5 degrees, 10 degrees, the loss is known. The losses are contributed by the atmosphere, absorption by uh, various uh, uh, meat in the atmospheric media like thick fog, absorption by the medium. So, the model of this graph is the higher the elevation angle, the lower is the loss of transmission. Next. Effects of molecular oxygen, water vapor, and electrons on signal loss. Again, I have given it in the y axis the absorption loss in decibels and in the uh, x axis frequency. You will see electron absorption, how it varies with the frequency, and so also. I think uh, this is applicable for not only electron, electron absorption but <coughs> together with water vapor and molecular oxygen all put together. We see that between about uh, 0.7 gigahertz to about 4 gigahertz the loss is the lowest. Next. The rain attenuation attenuation due to rain versus the frequency uh, we see that higher the frequency the attenuation is larger and higher the rainfall the attenuation is larger and there are two sets of graphs given like the result to the very heavy, very heavy rain uh, the heaviness of the rain is given in 60 mm per hour so we see that the attenuation is more at higher frequencies and with heavy rains. Next. So, uh, this is a graph which combines all the effects and this is a graph historically uh, which has been used to select in the formative days of satellite communication the frequency bands to be used. This shows somewhere between uh, 4 gigahertz to 6 gigahertz, 4 to 6 gigahertz, or uh, you can even ex lower it to 2 gigahertz to 6 gigahertz. The losses are the, the lowest, and that's why in those days, 4 and 6, 6 gigahertz were used, that they were corresponding to the standard C band frequencies, and that was the standard with which the satellite communication started. But Technology has changed to take care of all these attenuation factors at higher frequencies. Next. Other propagation effects. The other than the absorption, the RF signal can get scattered as it travels through the atmosphere uh, because of gas particles, uh, because of micro meteorites in the, in the environment. It can get refracted and diffracted uh, due to the thick atmospheric uh, columns. And there can be, because of the diffraction and diffraction, it can create multipath effect, different paths. One signal of the same carrier will come directly, which is stronger. Another one, which it gets diffracted or uh, refracted, it will come in another way. So multipath effects can create problem. <coughs> Scintillations. Uh, some frequencies like the band and all that shows higher scintillation with respect to the variation in the atmospheric conditions. Dispersion is another thing uh, which creates a uh, loss of signal. All these things reflects in the loss of signals like in the amplitude, phase, polarization, frequency, etc. Next. Noise due to stars. Here I have taken an example of sun. Uh, sun produces intense noise, either seen directly or through um, reflected to moon. So here is an example of uh, the satellite viewing the sun and, and that is why we call it a sun outage. Uh, you might have seen in uh, various VTH channels for some time in the 
twice in a year, uh, the signals are lost. They put a slider, sun out gauge. It lasts for some three, four minutes. So that is all. Similarly, uh, like the sun, other stars can also produce interference. Uh, it can cause uh, noise, noise into the channel. So such noise also it has to be taken into account. The signal has to be extracted in the background of all these noises. Next. So combined effect of all losses and system gains. I have taken a few examples. No, a DBW means one word. A transmitting antenna with a 62 dB uh, gain, transmit gain, uh, it, it has a transmit output power of 43 dB. Its directivity is such that it can produce an EIRP of 105 dB. Attenuation in rain and cloud 2 dB. Free space loss in the uplink. I have taken a 6 gigahertz signal, 200 decibels. <coughs> That is a satellite. I have considered two types of uh, received beams. One is a spot beam. And this type of a big antenna will produce a pencil beam and therefore it becomes a spot beam. Spot beam means not exactly pinpointing, it's a narrow beam. Whereas a smaller antenna, it looks like a horn, it, it will have a global coverage. So these antenna gains will be 29 dB and 17 dB. A front end gain of the satellite is 14 dB. And after receiving and the satellite is outputting a power of 8 dBW per transponder. Again on the transmit side, the antenna gain AAP per transponder for a spot gain global gain. I have seen 34 dW and 22 dW. A 4 gigahertz free space loss 196 dB. And the receiver antenna gain is about 59 dB. You receive a signal level of minus 103 dW in a spot beam from a spot beam from a bigger antenna and minus 150 dW in a global horn. This is a typical signal level representation in a satellite communication. Next. The same thing I am representing in a nomographic manner. And there I have considered a 4, 6 gigahertz. Here is the graph for 30, 20, 30 gigahertz transmission signal. Starting from the input signal, the station amplifier, transmitter system loss, and then the transmit antenna gain, loss due to the atmosphere, and then the air to satellite path loss, satellite receiving the antenna gain, boost the signal, amplification in the satellite in the power system, transmit satellite transmitting antenna gain, and that gives rise to the satellite ARP. And in the downlink, the satellite that air station path loss, loss due to atmosphere, air station receiving antenna gain boost the signal, low noise amplifier boost the signal, power amplifier further boost. So you get the output signal which is then demotivated and then sent to the user. Next. <coughs> so this is a very simple Mathematics, uh, this is high school level mathematics. Receiver, what we are interested in is ultimately carrier to noise ratio. Carrier to noise ratio. The received carrier to noise frequency ratio is AERP minus AERP can be from the station or from the satellite in any direction. One way, AERP path class plus the figure of merit. I am using a word for this figure of merit for the first time. Figure of merit is, I do not know how many people you were exposed to. 
figure of eight of a any antenna is given by the no, a by its own noise temperature, the system noise temperature. So figure of eight minus the various atmospheric rain equipment and other losses plus Boltzmann constant. In other words, the same thing translated to C by A received is equal to E A R P, either the down station of the satellite, losses D by P or at the satellite or at the ground station plus Boltzmann constant. Next. Non linearity in hyperarchies. Satellite amplifiers use either SSPAs or PWDAs. Hyperamplifiers exhibit inherent nonlinear behavior which causes signal degradation. <coughs> it produces gain compression. Gain compression means local system gain compression. And if you operate, don't bother about gain compression, operate at a full gain, then it produces intermodulation because of non-linearity, phase distortion and the intermodulation can, can be a adjacent channel interference. You have uh, 140 uh, megahertz band, another 40 megahertz band, the intermodulation of this band will, may fall into the next band, that is adjacent channel interference. Hence, the satcom channels are operated at a state of power, power output drag off in the linear region of the amplifier. Thus, one does not always derive the rated output power. If I put a 50 watts DWDA, I will not get the DPW corresponding to 50 watts. It will be at a lower level. This non-linearity is higher in a DWDA as compared to SSPA. SSPA is relatively more linear operation than a DWDA. You might have studied it. In vacuum tube technology, we have here a class A amplifier, class C amplifier operation, etc. It's very similar to that. Of course, technology has invented linearized TWPs to reduce the non linear effect at the expense of some insertion loss which is caused by a linearizer. If a non linear TWPA you have a 3 dB back off or 5 dB back off. This linearizing device in the TWDA may introduce 0.5 dB, 1 dB insertion loss. So if you can afford it, uh, we can get a better output power than operating in back off by operating in linearized TWDAs. Next. <coughs> in the satellite communication link, it is always the overall C by N which is taken into account for assessing the link performance. The link performance is nothing but the signal to noise ratio or energy per bit to noise ratio. So what is the overall carrier to noise ratio is nothing but this is a formula. You have to calculate the uplink C by N independently you have to calculate the downlink C by N independently. The overall C by N is 1 by 1 plus 1 by C by N uplink plus 1 by C by N downlink. Uh, this is how the overall C by N is to be calculated before you go for signal to noise ratio estimation and decide about the quality of the final signal. Next. <coughs> the measuring signal to noise levels. This is an oscilloscopic track, a trace. The noise level is at minus 35 dBmV. The carrier level is plus 35 dBmV. So the C by N ratio is the difference between these two 65 dB. This is just a representation to show how the C by N is measured. Yes. So, what are the performance numbers we are looking at? Decided, these are decided, they are all published by various international committees like Consultative Committee for International Radio, International Committee for Telephones and Telegraphy, Telecommunication Union, 
People's Registration Board, Radio Recognition Board, etc. Carrier to noise ratio analog or energy per bit to noise ratio digital or bit per bit or the factors deciding the user end performance of the circuit link. Of course, uh, technology also comes to uh, these are based on the R&D efforts. Uh, it also provides methods like low signal to noise ratio, signal detection to threshold extension methods, and higher the C by N or lower the filter ratio, it is better. Next. What are the SATCOM numbers for the desired service quality? We have seen uh, what are the services that are being offered like telecommunication, TV, business networks and all that. For a telecom service, the satellite EARP is typically 36 to 38 dBW. For a DTH service, the EARP from the satellite may be the range of 48 to 52 dBW. And for a video distribution, in C but I probably there are some signals which are analog transmission signals. These are called as video distribution uh, services, usually done in C band. In the earlier days it used to be done in S band also, but no more. Uh, this video distribution service in C band, if you have a EARP of 38 to 42 dBW is sufficient. For a high speed data, it has been excess of 55 dBW, even 58 dBW is seen. The figure of merit, the gain of the antenna to the noise temperature for C band, it, it, it lies in the range of minus 5 dB per degree Kelvin to plus 1 dB per degree Kelvin. For K band, it is minus 2 dB per degree Kelvin to plus 7 dB per degree Kelvin. This number enables C by N or EP by N not adequate for providing quality TV signal or voice or digital data. Quality means what? Quality TV signal. Quality means what? Quality means acceptable passive grade for TV or signal to noise ratio for voice or better rate. Higher the signal to noise ratio is acceptable. What is the higher signal to noise ratio? Minimum it has to be 45 dB. 45 dB, not dB. 45 dB. That should be the minimum value. Next. Okay. I have talked about, uh, I think I have covered all aspects of the baseline signals and the RF signals associated with only satellite. I have not talked about the microwave line of sight or uh, proper scatter or UHD things and all that. So, who are all the people who are making all these things possible? Who are all designing all these things? Systems engineers, they look into the service applications, user requirements, user interfaces, they look into the design trade offs. Payload configuration is steady, payload performance definition, uh, the requirements, factors like GYP, EARP, coverage contours, frequency bands, and coordination status. Orbit frequency has been coordinated there. There are hundreds of hundreds of satellites in the geostationary orbit. So to get your site to bring your own house is uh, very, very difficult. So, intersect, uh, the orbit vehicle's coordination status, uh, the ongoing effort status is to be known. Intersatellite and intrasatellite interference studies, system level payload performance analysis, etc., is all handled by payload systems engineers. Payload subsystem designers and performance analysts, they take care of individual subsystem hardware. Design and performance analysis like low noise amplifiers, mixers and the local oscillators, power amplifiers, high power and low power filters, antenna system, DC DC power supplies, etc. And of course, there is a third category of uh, specialists 
who are payload system integrators and test engineers. So these are the categories of uh, expertise needed for enabling a satellite communication system to come into functionality, come into being and operate satisfactorily. Uh, I have to say as a passing remark, subsystem designers and performance analysts, a person who is expert in low noise amplifiers will not look beyond the low noise amplifiers. A person who is an expert in antenna will not look anywhere beyond the antennas. They are thorough system experts. It is up to the systems engineer and to some extent the payload system integrator and test engineers who will take all the, who will talk to these subsystem designers and performance analysts to come to system level performance analysis. Next. I don't know whether it is very clear visible. Satcom system design trade-offs. What is the market requirement types of applications? Estimated traffic volume, government regulations, frequencies to be used, avoidance of terrestrial and microwave interference, number of air station antennas, noise tolerances, and uh, what are the type of access techniques to be used? Is it digitization and compression techniques for analog signals? <coughs> number of carriers per transponder, number of channels per transponder. Like this, so many inputs leads to the final configuration <coughs> of a satellite payload, communication payload. And antenna and receiver cost, cost of terrestrial interconnections, lifetime of the satellite system. And therefore, cost of the satellite cost per channel per year, all these factors. Uh, this is a nice design trade-up study uh, which is carried out by the systems engineers. Next. Okay, now I am migrating to uh, some of the ground station and satellite hardware components, how they look. Next. Uh, here is the air station configuration. This air station configuration for the satellite control facility located at Hassan. Uh, this is used for commanding to the satellite receiving telemetry signal and processing and displaying the telemetry information from the satellite and also for ranging. Just one example I'll give and then the rest of the things I will not describe. There is a command encoder. The command encoder is connected to IF modulator, FM modulator. And then, of course, there are buffers and interfacing cables. And then the IF modulator FM is taken. The IF is at 70 megahertz in our case. It can be 140 also in some cases. This is the assertion hardware. The dark blue line, the purple line, this goes to the up converter, and then the up converter converts the IF 70 megahertz to 6 gigahertz, 6410 megahertz, and then it is taken to the iPod amplifier, and then it is taken to the feed and to the transmit antenna. I have shown this 7 means nothing, it's the seventh uh, antenna of the facility. And the polarization is in the dead city, I'm sorry, all the city in the transmit sector. And similarly, for the receiving of the elementary and uh, for the ranging transmit and receive both. Uh, this is the overall schematic. Next. Similarly, I am not showing on board a telecommand and telemetry system, but I am showing a communication payload subsystem. Uh, I am showing a trans receive reflector on the left top, and that is possible because of the 
auto mode transducer which will handle both trans and receive signals. <coughs> you, you have the pre-select filter PSF. There is a switch which connects you to either trans receiver 1 or receiver 2. Uh, receiver 1 and 2 are redundant receivers for the sake of reliability. Then through a hybrid it goes to input mux. Input mux switch connects to the high power amplifiers. In this case I have shown SSPS. After power amplification it goes to the output mux through a switch and it goes to the output mux through an isolator, harmonic reject filter it goes to the same transmit reflector through the OMD. The uplink from the ground to the satellite is in a almost about 7 gigahertz range. The downlink is in a 4.7 gigahertz range. And this is one typical representation of the onboard satellite system, uh, payload system. Next. This is a typical air station antenna. This is a 11 meter antenna, whereas these are all the smaller size antennas, typically about 6 meter antennas. Each dedicated to one satellite for receiving the telemetry, for commanding them. You see, they are all have <coughs> different look angles. Uh, they are not pointing to any one angle. This is used for usually as a tracking antenna. These are for on station and satellites. These are used one antenna for each of the satellites. So they are all looking at different orbital slots, different satellites. Next. Overview of uh, ground space for that. Next. And uh, this is a ground hardware. This is a VSAT terminal. Uh, both are VSAT terminals. That is only one meter, whereas this is a three meter dish. Next. The payload subsystem, a C band on board the satellite, C band receiver will look like this. This uh, clarity of the picture is not good. It is a K band receiver, just like K band, just like C band, a K band receiver. Picture quality is not so good. Next. I see the top two pictures or the space plane EWTS, the bottom picture is an SSPA. <coughs> I don't know, I don't remember what is the wattage. And looking at it, from my experience, I can say this could be a 50 watt EWTS and this could be a 10 or 15 watt SSPA. Next. The multiplexer, uh, this is a K-Card regional max and this is a C band 6 channel max. You see here, it's a, each of them is a cavity filter, the multi stage cavity filter for each channel, allocated to each channel. Next. <coughs> Similarly, 9 channel max and 6 channel O max. I max and O max, input max and output max. Next. That is a 2 meter. Deployable reflector. What is the meaning of deployable reflector is it will be stowed to the spacecraft body at launch and on or it will get by command it will get deployed. That is a C band deployable reflector, 2 meter size. The top is called as a yoke that will be anchored to the satellite body uh, for the purpose of uh, securing it during launch. And this is a C band feed which will be used along with uh, that type of an antenna. Next. And this is a special field. It can handle both C band and S band. It's a multi frequency field, CS band field. This is an exclusive KU band fixed antenna. This is not deployable. It has got legs, three legs, two legs, and one big broader leg using which it can be anchored on the satellite. It's a one meter dish with a feed on the mast. It produces a shaped beam antenna covering India. Next. And this is a, a figure, actual figure of a 
phased array antenna system. Uh, here the antenna beam can be uh, it can be directed. Antenna beam can be beam can be changed to look at different uh, points on the head. Next. And this is a compact antenna test range where antennas are tested either individually as an antenna and as part of a satellite. Next picture will show a satellite sitting under in the compact antenna test range with its deployed reflector and fixed antennas and undergoing characterization. Characterization means what is the beam shape, what is the beam. Uh, Beam center gain, what is the side load gains, all these things are the characterization. Next. Now, I will show some of the typical antenna coverages which we get from the satellite antenna. Next. This is a C band expanded coverage. It covers beyond India. This is India, which is going to Middle East and up to Egypt. Uh, this is the primary coverage, this is the secondary coverage. In the primary coverage you get 36 dBW EARP, the secondary coverage you get 32 dBW. It goes up to Andaman Kami Kobar. So this is one type of coverage. Next. Uh, this is a, a shaped wide coverage. India shape, it covers the Middle East. It covers the entire uh, East Asia and it goes up to Australia. This type of coverage we provide in one of the satellites. Next. India shaped within. This is only hugging India mainland, only Indian mainland shaped within coverage. Next. Uh, this is a multi beam coverage in KU band uh, providing. Five spot beams over India only, one for the south zone, one for the north, one for the east, west, and the central zone. <coughs> this uh, beam, each beam uh, has an ARP of 55 dBW, which is very large, fairly large. And this, the application of this beam was for providing educational services in the country for EDUSAT. EDUSAT was a satellite which had this type of coverage. So in the regional specific educational programs which was broadcast using this satellite and these are the coverages which we got. Next. I'm coming to present and future trends. Beam steering, we have done it. 
in our sunlight, Prakash now will watch for it. But unfortunately, that antenna was not from us. Uh, we have used beam scaring in uh, a satellite built by us for a foreign client, W2EM. Uh, Wi-Fi multimedia connectivity, high throughput. Examples are IP star and our own uh, GSAT 11, which has got a total throughput of 16 gigabits per second. These are all the trends in the satellite communication, which most of them we are implementing or have, have implemented in our satellites. Next. Onboard switching. I am just giving a, a pictorial representation of how it is done in our GSAT 11. Uh, there are two types of beam, uh, beam communication. Intra beam. This is one beam, and uh, one can communicate within the beam, and one can communicate from one beam to another beam. This is inter beam communication. This type of uh, communication is possible through onboard switching. The type of switching is star, user to hub and vice versa, and mesh, inter beam routing or intra beam routing. Uh, that is a type of uh, this network uh, configuration, which I think you will be able to appreciate and understand. Next. Onboard switching in multi-beam case. Uh, there are different processing, processing methods. One is a transparent processing, routing control through ground command or signaling channel. When you are transmitting the signal from one beam, you have a control signal which indicates to which other beam it has been transmitted, it has been sent down later. That is called as trans transparent processing. Transmission processing. Packet header is decoded for routing address by the onboard logic. A packet header, header is added to the communication, total communication packet, packets, and that is decoded on board for routing and deciding on the routing requirement. Uh, we are using the transparent processing, not the translucent processing. Regenerative processing, complete demodulation, decoding, and coding modulation dialogue on board. This is total regenerative processing. <coughs> we don't have this state. So, this is a pictorial representation of the transparent processing. Next. Onboard signal processing. Transparent processor, regenerative processor. Signal, single beam regenerative payload. Baseband process, amplify, error correction, coding, switching, reforming. Uh, as I told, this I would put it as a, an example of the recent trends, but we don't have it yet. Next. Uh, beam steering. See, you may have one uh, beam covering an intended area. Uh, you may like to have another beam which, uh, which you would like to do a bordering based on the traffic requirements. That is where the beam steering comes. Uh, there are two types of uh, steering possible. Mechanically steerable, that is what we implemented in W2M. And uh, it is, antenna is steered from one loop angle to another loop angle uh, to carry out the communication. And the other one is electronically, electrically, electronically reconfigurable, reconfigurable and thus phase level free. Uh, we have used it in our uh, lower orbiting remote sensing satellites. We have used phase area antenna. This is an example of an immersat phase area antenna configuration. So one is the mechanically suitable, electrically reconfigurable. Next. Beam popping. <coughs> the 
this is another technique which we have not used uh, but is possibly a, a recent trend. It is used in high throughput satellites, fixed high throughput satellite beam mapping. You have got two beams, uh, you have one beam, uh, you switch from this coverage area to this coverage area. That is one thing. Here, uh, beam space time share satellite payload in BH mode. This is another scheme. I will read out. Coverage provided by a fixed beam at a given location at all times. Resource wasted if there are no users. This is the disadvantage of fixed beam system. In a beam hopping, few beams are switched in time and space depending on the traffic demand. Available full bandwidth can be allocated to in each beam. Fewer are chains, optimal onboard resource utilization. Beam switching carried out through RF for electronic phase, minimum unused capacity. How is the RF beam hopping done? Is through this type of switching. You have multiple antennas for different uh, spot beams, and the signal is switched depending on the traffic demands. Next. Continuing on the future trends, uh, one thing which is being talked about quite widely is flexible payload architecture where power, uh, coverage, shape, and position of the beams can be altered to suit the traffic and business requirements. Partly done, partly to be completely done in a practical way. And the, the next bullet is something very and important it is happening in the, the total uh, satellite scenario. A cluster of Leo satellites <coughs> providing phone or messaging services for high speed data links. There are various types of satellites like Iridium, OneWeb, Telesat, Amazon, O3B, Starly, etc. Uh, today we are quite familiar with the one way by starting which is coming more which is appearing more in uh, news but Iridium is already existing and uh, what is uh, coming up is Amazon in a big way O3D is coming in a very slow manner ok next yes having said one way by starting uh, this is the satellite cluster which will go around the earth one week, one week satellite will look like this. It weighs, the satellite itself weighs only 150 kg. It flies in a 1200 kilometers per hour of it. 650 satellites are planned. I think about uh, 400 satellites have already been put in orbit. It has scaled and payload. Its uh, intention is internet service. <coughs> Starlink satellite, uh, the the satellite itself weighs less than 300 kg. Uh, it has a low earth as well as sun-synchronous orbits. Some 4,400 satellites have been planned. What I understand is about 3,200 satellites have been already launched. Uh, most of the satellites are launched in stacks of and tens of satellites by uh, SpaceX rocket service. It operates in KU car and E band, and that also has got an intention of providing broadband internet service. Next. I'll be test. This is our own G set level.
Yes, I should have guessed that. Thank you. Sir, you tell us more about TWTA and DIR. TWTA, TWTA or SSPA is a power amplifier device that we probably know. Uh, see, I didn't go into these acronyms and all that. It's my fault. AARP stands for Equivalent Isotropically Radiated Power. Equivalent Isotropically Radiated Power. And uh, that shows, uh, supposing you have an antimatrium isotropic characteristic, at a particular point away from the transmitting antenna, you receive some power. Okay? And if you put a, a directed, directed antenna, and uh, it's the transmitting antenna will have a pencil beam that will transmit towards that particular direction where the receiver point is located and you receive the power. <coughs> For the transmitting antenna, what is an equivalent isotropic radiated power that it is going to deliver in the pencil beam? That is the context. I wanted to know whether in a time bomb multiplex situation, uh, are you allocating based on the battery width or is it actually just a random number allocation? Uh, How are talking that about the basement or the other side? The basement. Basement. Can you repeat the question? Time division. Okay. So, uh, a time division, uh, during time division multiplex. In the basement. Time division multiplexing. Okay. What is the question? So uh, you spoke about how it, uh, how uh, the multiplexing is done based on the uh, packaging. Uh, based on packaging. Packaging. Package. Pa packets going in a uh, slotted manner, time slotted manner. Yes. So yes. the time slots. How do you select the time slots? How do you select the time slots? Oh, how do you select the time slots? Oh, that is. Uh, that is an analysis, the traffic management analysis. Depending on the number of users, depending on the traffic flow, uh, it is devised by the system designer uh, whether he should allow a larger time window for, for supposing there are only 10 users and uh, he can allot a larger time window for each of the users. If there are 100 users, he has to allot a smaller time window for each of the users. So it's a system design, is part of the system design. The communication system design aspect will take into account that. I don't know whether I answered your question. See the individual user data packets, digital packets have to go in the same communication channel in a time shared manner. So if you see the time timeline plotting, each burst from different users occur consecutively, one after another, one after another. So the time window for each user is decided by the total traffic volume. The, I'll show one slide. Can uh, you? No, no. Keep going back, going back, going back. Slowly, slowly. Stay back, stay back. Stay back, stay back. Stay back, stay back. Stay back, stay back.
for using the media, communication media. That assessment has to come through a survey, uh, through the uh, interface between the users and the system designers. It has to come. Based on this, you are posting with the answer. Now, is it fixed or right? Yeah, I have to. I have to. Once it is, uh, as of now, to my knowledge, it is fixed. Uh, maybe. I'm not sure. Maybe it is dynamically ah, dynamically changeable, but I'm not aware. Of course, uh, that is a very valid question because the traffic will yeah. increase with time. So the, the allocation time window allocation has to keep changing. To accommodate it from pardon? Hmm, that is application. This is uh, something like connected with the technology. Yes, the answer can be basically dynamically programmed to allow more number of users, giving a lesser time window for each of the users. Yes, it is possible, uh, but I am not aware. It should be possible, logically, it should be possible. So, uh, I have a question. So, uh, in your experience, being a project manager, I mean, we've seen so many systems and subsystems, and each of them being more complex than the other. And when it comes to integrating all of this, uh, what was probably one of the most challenging aspects of your role? Would you like to share any experience with us? Give us Every day is a challenge. <laughs> Every day is a challenge. Uh, he, he, some, sometimes it can be a minor challenge. Uh, of course, I, I talked about satellite communication. Uh, in my role had not been in the satellite communication except for uh, my users, my interfaces with the users. Users are the users of which the users are those with who use satellite communication. Uh, my role for a majority number of things was in the delivery of the satellites. So, of course, as I told you in one slide, there are systems engineers. Payload systems engineers. Uh, they are divided. Uh, geographically, they are divided uh, at Bangalore and Ahmedabad. Systems engineers. At headquarters, ISRO headquarters in the satellite communication program office, which I handled for a couple of years, and then at Ahmedabad. These people have to interface with the users like DOD, Blue uh, Darshan and many other private private users, private business users, they have to communicate with them to find out their requirements in uh, designing a payload, designing a payload configuration, payload performance requirements and all that. For example, antenna coverage is one requirement. What is a power transmitter requirement is another requirement. Uh, so these people will take the traffic information also from the present and future growth in the configuring of payload and its uh, uh, various parameters, performance parameters. So, if you look at this, my job was satellite delivery. Of course, because of my interest, I have interacted with the user community. I know all of their requirements very well. But in satellite delivery itself, they were Day to day, several challenges, uh, small or big, there could be several challenges. Challenges can be in the technicalities of the schedule. And technicalities, we have the sufficient capacity, capability within ISRO to work out solutions for the technical challenges. It could have an impact on the schedule. Whether that schedule in fact has can be dominated by the project is a challenge. Uh, there can be n number of examples. For example, some satellite on or rate performance will be totally different than the expected. Uh, to analyze that, one single person will not be there. There will be a committee. The committee will have to take their data take the inputs from the people, they have to analyze, they have to give their recommendations for the future satellites, corrective measures for the future satellites. Those corrective measures 
once it is known, you can implement in your current project view, satellite project, for your current satellite delivery. That is a challenge. We will have scheduling impact. It may have uh, configuration impact also. It may have hardware realization impact also. Those are the types of challenges which the uh, project director or the project team handles in the satellite delivery. Anyone else would like to ask a question? Any more questions in So I have a question. Uh, is this 1% of uh, onboard electronics has been integrated recently in checks? Onboard, 1% on of onboard electronics has been integrated. Integrated? Integrated in form of IC checks. Uh, and miniaturization. Miniaturization. That means also the effect of uh, how do you meet the uh, radiation there uh, in space. Can you answer? Or on my behalf? I think uh, miniaturization wise, it is a constant process. <coughs> because continuously, like from PWDA, we have come to SSPS, future we may come to see the smaller and so it's a continuous process by the any other electronic engineering is aware. So every day, like <coughs> every piece of cell phone is changing, small size, you cannot reduce for that. Same as side side also, a larger capability is built into smaller satellites. Okay? That is uh, on the front of the miniaturization, especially not only in electronics, even in the propulsion systems and all, we are having our electric propulsion and all which will be significantly reducing the weight of the spacecraft. Whatever 6 ton, 8 ton and all, they will become history. 4 to 5 times tons, we should be able to manage the 15 years satellite with the advanced capabilities. Coming to radiation, yes, anyway, during my talk, I will be following. So, but just to give a brief, space is a very, very difficult atmosphere, especially geosynchronous orbit, where most of the communication satellites, everywhere used to be there now, of course, with the advent of this bio uh, satellite <coughs> that has changed, but there are also some region, particular region is there called Van Amel Belts. So, whenever a spacecraft goes through this particular environment, the electronics can misbehave. Okay. It could be a soft problem which may reset into the processor and again recover through ground. Sometimes, especially in geosynchronous, if a single particle, an electron, or a program, if it is a powerful enough to form up, if it is powerful enough to go through, it can upset the devices temporarily or permanent damage also can be there. Towards that, especially in the synchronous software, what we use is are the components called red hot components, radiation hardened components. The cost you pay is, of course, in the terms of the price. What otherwise may cost one rupee, could be 100 rupees, or it could be even 1000 rupees like that. And you have to test because you have to test the components for the effectiveness of this radiation. Like from technology, the portal knowledge is different, but earlier the complete fabrication floor in the 1995 floor is dedicated to manufacturing. Like from the wafer selection onwards, it has to be recognized again as the space radiation. <coughs> and the volumes are low. As you can see, how many satellites are there? We get only hundreds of them. With all that, a huge number of it will not exceed 1000. So when you make something for 1000 or even 10,000, you take starving power. The volumes are less, so it becomes a very expensive. Yeah. So for that, various things are evolving. Otherwise, on the processor side, especially VMS and devices, if you take, techniques are given where even if a particular memory location got disturbed, there are techniques for major keyboarding. What you do is you have three processors, which will be uh, three memories you have. You want even if the probability of one particle disturbing itself is less and three simultaneously or two of them simultaneously is very very less. So you do the major reporting and you take the best of the things and the space schedule and all like that if you take up some processors, five processors should be around. Okay, where a human life is involved and all. So there will be simultaneously parallel in one and major reporting is there. These are small of the techniques. So definitely no radiation is more or less and it works. I want to have
uh, the militarization of electronics is one thing which take proud. From one satellite to another satellite, we are very happy to reduce the volume of a package, the weight of a package, telemetry telecommand package, AOCS package, integrated telecommand and the AOCS packages. These are all the evolution process. But how it is possible through miniaturization? Earlier, discrete circuit boards, TMPC will have three packages, three uh, hardware packages, each with uh, some 12 parts having discrete circuits. And now, slowly, they have been transformed into use of hybrid microcircuits, VLSI chips. Application specific integrated circuits, ASICs, and of course uh, the microprocessors for logical decision making. Uh, through this technology upgradation, the package sizes have been minimized, the, the volume is minimized, the weight is minimized. In fact, uh, combining the various functionalities which used to be distributed is getting combined into single packaging, all functionalities into one single packaging. And this is how the miniaturization travel is happening. Uh, when I left, this was the trend, it could be even much better than now. That's what it is. System on chip. System on chip is another technology which we have here. Uh, that is one possibility. But with uh, one small pricking point is today uh, the space activities are uh, getting away from ISCO to private industry. Uh, these, whatever I have told and whatever he has told, they are all very costly, very capital intensive. And whether this private sector will be able to get so much of money and whether they will be able to implement uh, the way ISRO was implementing is something not I am not known to me. That is a picking point that I do not know, I don't have the answer. Thank you, Kaisa. We have waited much. Uh, any more questions? If there are no questions, so it's time that uh, we thank our speaker, uh, give it a big round of applause. So in just about two hours, uh, he has taken us through various aspects of satellite communication, starting from basics of communication, the stereo array, MPM, and so on, all the way up to uh, payload and uh, various trade-offs that are involved in uh, 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 payload architecture and also the couple couple generating other subsystems and so on. <coughs> Thank you very much, sir. And uh, as youngsters, there is one more thing that all of us need to know. Uh, he is a he has retired from service, but that his commitment, his passion towards satellite communication is unmatched, sir. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Electronics and Communication, faculty and students, we assure you, sir, that you can try to emulate your passion, your commitment to technology. Thank you. 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 Passion, passion is the word. Passion is the word. And of course, some of our youngsters, like in uh, first year uh, students, you know, they have come to the college at 8 in the morning and still their energy is uh, so very visible to all of us. And uh, uh, that is also to be appreciated. <laughs> As a token of appreciation, I would like to request Mr. Narasundar to hand over a small moment to uh, this new campus.
Nanasundar was my classmate in electronics batch of 1972. We passed out together. I am UBC. I am happy that he, he is here. And he said he needs a work and he wants to go back. But I am surprised that he has sat through this uh, my lecture. My lecture. I don't know he whether he liked it or uh, uh, he has to tell that. And so also my other friend Gangadharan also was my classmate. And there was one other person, Professor Murali. He was in the academic field after his IASC pass out, master's degree IAC passed out. And he was uh, teaching satellite communication, uh, art of communication and satellite communication as an optional subject. He was there up to some time, 4, 4.30 he was there, but he had some other commitments, he has left the place. So I am happy to have them among me. Thank you. The lecture was so absurd, that I could not come out of my seat. I hope all of you all realize the same thing. And the whole lecture, as you said in the beginning, it's such a vast subject, we cannot really cover it in two hours. But what he has created is a spark. The spark will ignite your thirst for knowledge on scientific communication, gives you an insight, and then it makes us better engineers. So let us thank Neil Kandran once again for this. I would like to see, we are uh, the batch of uh, electronic engineers who graduated in 1972, 50 years back in the same college. So, and after 50 years when we, we thought it was a golden jubilee of our graduation, we thought let us do something for our college, let us stay back. Then we talked, we had a WhatsApp, WhatsApp group and then we collected ideas and then we discussed with Dr. Davish and then we donated some equipment which could be used in the lab here. So, while well, during the discussion, we also talked, Dr. Davish noticed that some of us, some of the people had a very great experience which can be really shared with the students today so that their knowledge can inspire them to become greater engineers. So that's why he, he invited the people to give us lectures, give lectures. And the first one was uh, Mr. Neil Kantan. Satellite communication is a, it is a unique subject. It's not very common. And, uh, so on that he has given such an insight to all of us and I think that is very well appreciated. Thank you very much. What is there to celebrate? 50 years of uh, your graduation, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you.